So um, this is very interesting because it's a very specific talk about time that I have been given to give, although there is no time. So just to bear that in mind from the very beginning. Um, and I'd like to start with you, ask you to imagine something. Imagine you are in the middle of the stone circle in Stonehenge, and it is just before dawn on the summer solstice, this tremendously ancient, sacred monument on the Salisbury Plain in England. So imagine you're in the center of this incredibly powerful monument just before dawn on the summer solstice. And as the sun rises and it comes through these ancient stones and then it falls onto the altar in the middle of the stone circle. That, friends, is a moment in time. And that is what I want to explore with you today. The meaning, the significance of a moment in time. And I should say from the very beginning the, the paradox here, because as most of you know from a deeply spiritual perspective, time is an illusion. Time does not exist. There is no such thing as time. Any real spiritual experience happens outside of time, happens in the moment. There is no past and there is no future. And in fact, the, the plane of the self, the center of consciousness of our true nature is completely outside of time. And any of you who've had an experience of that reality will know that. There is no time there. I was, in fact, given an experience of that dimension, that reality, in my early 20s. It was a very powerful, very disturbing experience that took me six months to adjust from. And actually, during those six months, when I was 23, I, I lived completely outside of time. I would sit in a chair all day without any consciousness of time. I was 23. I was, happened to be living with my mother at the time. She cooked for me occasionally, and I ate occasionally. But really, for that six months, I was completely out of time. And in a state of bliss, because that is the, the reality of the self. It's called the Nanda Mayakosha in Sanskrit, the sheath of the soul, which is, which is bliss. So in that reality within ourselves, there is no time, there never was time, there never will be time, which is why if you do a deep meditation, it doesn't matter if you are meditating for a minute or an hour because you are present where there is no time. And that is the most basic spiritual truth with regard to time. It does not exist. And yet, when I was 23, I I'd actually took a year off college to have this experience. And, um, yeah, and I had to come back into time to finish my degree. And it was, took a little time to come back into time. <laughs> Actually, for some reason, I, I used the works of Charles Dickens. For three months, I read the entire works of Charles Dickens, and that <laughs> brought me back from the plane of the self, back into a reality where I could go back to college and finish my studies and become an English teacher. So. That was a unique experience. Most of us don't have six months or a year that we can take off outside of time and then have to come back. Normally, it's a, a moment in and out of time that we are given through grace where we can step out of this very time-bound culture into another reality. And it is, in a way, a completely different reality. It's not anywhere else. It's actually much more here than our time consciousness. I think it is also important to realize we in the West have a very particular concept of time. 
We see time as this river of events that is passing, never to return. In fact, the only thing that's ever been stolen from me at our meditation center was a, a cup which I prized very much because it had written on it this saying, God put me on earth to accomplish a certain number of things. Right now, I'm so far behind, I guess I will never die. <laughs> and that is this time-bound consciousness which in the West we have created. And in fact, I feel that we have a very negative relationship to time. We, we feel caught in time. There is never enough time. We have this strange American word called schedules, like we are trains that have to run on time, and our schedules get filled, and our diaries get filled, and, and time is actually becomes antagonistic. And it's, we can never recapture things. And, and it is important to realize, if one is going to understand time, that this is a very particular relationship to time we have created for ourselves. It's quite a recent relationship to time. Um, and I'd just like to give a few examples of other cultures that have a very different relationship to time. For example, some of you may know about the Mokan, who are the sea gypsies who live on the coast of what used to be called Burma in Thailand. They are very simple people. They, they live in boats. They have very few possessions. They have their own language. And in their language, there is no word for time. Time actually does not exist for them at all in the way that it, ex it exists for us. They have no word for hello, no word for goodbye. They live very simply. They live in the moment. And yet it was very interesting, or more than interesting, because when there was this tsunami that hit the coast of Thailand, the coast of Burma, they were the ones that survived. And they survived because they were aware. And they saw this unique thing that the sea started to recede. It started to go out. And they were aware of this. And at that moment, they dug into their ancestral memories, passed down from generation to generation. And in their ancestral memories, there was a warning and a teaching that said, if that happens, you must go into deep water. So in their boats, they went into deep water. And when the tsunami came, they survived. They weren't hurt at all. And they, somebody asked them, what about the Burmese sailors? The Burmese sailors were very close to land. And they were all killed by the tsunami. And the Mokans said, they weren't aware. They did not notice. So there we have a culture with no concept of time except ancestral time and a quality of awareness. And with that quality of awareness, their whole culture was saved from this tsunami. And then we have the Aboriginal people in Australia who have a different relationship to time. For them, time is an opportunity. Every moment in time is an opportunity to return to the primordial moment. In the primordial moment, dream time comes into existence. In that primordial moment, the creative energy of the inner world comes into this world. And for them, time is not a linear progression of events. Time is this primordial moment, when dream time, the time of the inner world, the deeper rhythm of the soul, if you like, or for them, the soul of the world, that deep creative energy comes into existence. And their whole teaching, their whole way of life is that each moment is not something lost or found, is an opportunity to return to this primordial moment. A very different relationship to life, a very different consciousness. I often think one of the limitations of our present culture is that we are caught in a particular 
idea of consciousness and don't realize it, it is actually quite recent. It is quite a recent phenomena. And one of the examples of this is our relationship to time. If you just go back to the early medieval time, you will discover that people there lived in cyclical time, not a flow of events that went from past to future. Theirs was a cyclical time. They didn't have clocks. Clocks weren't around. They had the changing of the seasons and the light and darkness of the day. That was the time they lived in, cyclical time. Everything repeated. There is a time for everything under the sun. And in fact, very movingly, if those people at that time had any relationship to time, it was not the time that we know of hours and minutes. It was not a time in relationship to a clock, because they didn't have clocks. The time they knew was the tolling of the monastery bells, because those often they would be farming on monastery land, and it was the tolling of the bells for prayer that marked their division of the day. For example, the matins during the night, or prime in the early morning, or vespers in the evening. That was their relationship to time, a time that was marked by the calling to prayer. It's a very different relationship to time just a time that was marked every three hours by the tolling of the monastery bells that called the monks to prayer. That was their time, as well as the changing of the seasons and the light and darkness of the day. A very different relationship to time. And yet we have found ourselves caught in time, constricted by time, which is actually not necessary. There was a time when I worked deep in the unconscious and was taught the deeper rhythms of time and was taught a time in which the cells of our body relate to the movement of the stars and the waxing and waning of the moon. Women actually still carry that time in their bodies, in their menstrual cycle, a cyclical time in which your own existence is linked to the moon and the cycles of the moon. A very different relationship of to time, just like the time of the planting when the seeds go deep into the ground and grow and bring the harvest. A very different relationship to time. And what the, the gods of the underworld, they actually taught me how we have mistreated time and time, as a result, has become this prison. Do I have enough time? And one thinks there is this, this line in, in Alice in Wonderland in the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, because Lewis Carroll, who wrote it, had a kind of mystical bent to him. And there is this, those of you who know the Mad Hatter's Tea Party in Alice in Wonderland, it's always 4 o'clock. And <laughs> They never have time to wash the, the tea things. They have to move around the table. And the Mad Hatter explains why. He said, well, I said one day I was going to kill time. And that's what happened. So we no longer have a time that nourishes us. We no longer have a time that connects us to things that grow or to the stars that move. And we have imprisoned our consciousness into this very constricted image of time in which we fill up our days. And we don't know how to speak to time. We don't know how to make time move. There is a way you can make time become flexible. You can get, you, there is always enough time. It's something I learned long ago. You can make time move. You can expand time if you want to. Those of you who go deep in meditation know that. You can have five minutes, and you can go into deep meditation, deep inner silence, and time will there expand. And you can have many, many experiences in five minutes. And sometimes you need five hours. Time flows. Time is not static. Time can change. 
And once you take your consciousness into this bigger dimension of time, you become aware that something at this moment in time is happening. And that is what I want to try and take you into. And I would just like at this moment to add a little line of Rumi. I am, I am a Sufi, so um, what Rumi says, he says, step out of the circle of time and into the circle of love. Within the heart, there is a very different rhythm of time to what we have in our mind. And those of you who practice any meditation in which you take the mind into the heart, and there are many dif different forms of meditation practice that do this, you will find that the heart has a very different rhythm and a very different beat. And in fact, there is a, a practice where you align the beat of your heart in meditation to the rhythm of the stars. So you're in tune with that time within the heart, which, which is no time, which is this doorway between the worlds. So once you take your consciousness out of this limited prison of time into this deeper cyclical time, then one is aware that something very strange is happening at this moment in time. It is every moment of, of time is, of course, unique. No moment of time is the same. In fact, there is a spiritual teaching that every moment in time the world is created anew. And every moment in time the world dissolves. We just don't have a quick enough consciousness to grasp it. We are caught in this illusion of continuity. But that every moment it is anew. And that is one of the reasons with real spiritual practice one practices attentiveness, awareness, so you can catch the moment, so you can be present, so that you can actually, for maybe a moment in your life, become aware. Maybe for just a moment in your life, you're actually aware, you're actually present. And if you catch this moment, the moment that is now, it is actually part of a fascinating cycle of time. And here, I would like to bring in an even deeper cycle of time, not just the cycle of the seasons or the rhythms of one's own body, but this uh, teachings of the Mayan calendar. Now, the Mayans probably had the deepest understanding of time in any civilization. Their whole spiritual teaching was based upon time and the cycles of time, in particular, the cosmic cycles of time, which is something in our culture we have no understanding of whatsoever. And I think it's always important to be aware when you are discussing spiritual matters of what we know and what we don't know. For example, in my late teens, I studied sacred geometry, which is a very deep esoteric science in which places like Chartres Cathedral were built. And one of the things I realized is that spiritual esoteric knowledge has been lost now. We have no real understanding of sacred geometry, of how the harmonies in a building can relate, relate to the spiritual centers of a human being. We don't understand sacred geometry. It is an esoteric knowledge that has been lost. And this is the whole teaching of the Mayan calendar and the whole teaching of this moment in time next year in December when the Mayan calendar comes to an end. And there has been enormous speculation about what that means. And for some bizarre reason, I've even been asked to write a chapter in two different books on this subject, although I know nothing about the Mayan calendar, and I don't believe in prophecy. <laughs> so <laughs> next year, the Great Cycle, which is a 26,000-year cycle, comes to an end. And some people say it's the end of time, and some people say it's the beginning of time. And some people say it's the beginning of the golden age. And I don't believe in making prophecy, but like the Mokan, I do believe in awareness. And yes, in deep states of meditation, there is no time. Time does not exist. On that plane of the self, 
And many of you have had experiences of it. T.S. Eliot calls it very beautifully, the moment in and out of time. That moment of pure awareness when you're completely alive. There is no past, there is no future, there is no cycle of anything. You're outside of time. And you can glimpse this when the heart really opens, because when the heart really opens, you step out of the circle of time, you step into the circle of love, and you are present in your own heart, which is why I was always intrigued when people are deeply in love. They will say to their partner, I will love you forever. And at that moment, it is not a daydream. It is completely true. Because in that moment of pure love, it is forever. Love does not belong to time. Any moment of real love is a moment forever. So in that moment, when their heart is open, when they are in love, they will love their partner forever. Five years later, it may be a different story, a different time. The love may have gone. Forever is no longer present. But in that moment of real love, there is no time, there is forever. But what does this whole teachings about time mean? Well, as I said, I became an English teacher, and there was a little line from Shakespeare that I find very meaningful. There is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. And in this simple statement from Julius Caesar, there is a deep spiritual teaching. There are moments. There are moments that are more meaningful than other moments. And one of the teachings one learns on the Sufi path is to watch the moment, to be attentive to the moment. It is said one should be like the cat at the mouse hole, infinitely relaxed and infinitely attentive, just waiting for the mouse so that you can grab it. And being involved in spiritual teaching in human beings, I have learned that there are moments in the destiny of the soul. Like the tide, you see, the image of the tide was very important for at the time of Shakespeare, because if you were going to sail in a sailing ship, you had to catch the tide. The tide would take your ship, for example, if you were in London, out into the river, out into the sea. If you lost the tide, you had to wait till the tide came again. And there are moments in our own destiny that if we catch, our whole life can change. And if we miss, we are left behind. For me, such a moment was when I was 19 and I was invited to a talk on mathematics. And there was a little old lady with her white hair tied up in a bun sitting in front of me. And after the talk, she was introduced to me and I shook her hand and she gave me one look from these piercing blue eyes. And in that moment, I had the experience of becoming just a piece of dust on the floor. That was a moment in my life in which something began I had no words for and did not understand for many, many years. A spiritual process began. And if you are on the spiritual path, it is really important to be aware of the rhythm of the soul, which is different to our concept of time. There used to be an understanding of this. Again, Shakespeare wrote about the seven ages of man and the rhythm of one's life and the rhythm of one's soul. There are, in fact, certain moments in one's life when one can make, I don't like to use the word progress because it is really a misunderstanding, but let's say one can make a spiritual jump from one plane to another plane, from one cycle of existence to another cycle of existence, just as there are moments when one can fall back if one is not attentive. And you learn to watch for those moments. You listen, you watch. Real spiritual life, in my understanding, is a, a lot like being the, the cat at the mouse hole. You watch, you are always attentive, you listen, you look for the signs in life. There is a saying beloved of the Sufis, he has placed his signs on the horizons and in themselves. 
The, hori the signs on the horizons are the signs in life. We have so little understanding of life as because we have lost the symbolic dimension of life. We don't know how to look. We don't know how to watch. We take things as the surface phenomena. We don't know how to read the book of life. We're not taught it. And the sages that used to understand it, the shamans, they have gone. So when we read the papers, do we know what is happening? No. We have forgotten how to catch those moments, how to see beneath the surface. We have forgotten how to watch. And just the same way there are signs within us. On our path, we listen to our dreams a lot, because in the dreams there is a different language, there is a different understanding, there is a different rhythm that is the rhythm of the soul. And in the soul, the soul speaks to us to be attentive to certain moments when a door between the worlds opens and we can walk through. Otherwise, again, to quote T.S. Eliot, we had the experience but missed the meaning. And then we continue. Shakespeare says, omitted all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. We miss the inner opportunity. We don't see the door that was opened. We don't walk through into a deeper dimension of our own being. So it is this meeting of outer synchronicities, outer symbolic occurrences, and this listening within to the voice within to the rhythm of the soul, that you begin to see there is this flow of events. And there are meaning in certain moments, in certain days. You watch them like you can watch the flight of the birds. And, and you notice certain things. And you notice how most people are completely asleep. And they are caught in their image of themselves or the image this culture has created. And as a result, we are like in a small boat at this moment, paddling, to, paddling towards an enormous waterfall, having no idea because we didn't see the signs. We were not like the Mokan. We didn't see the tide. We didn't see the sea recede. We didn't know to paddle to deeper water. And so we are heading faster and faster towards this moment in cosmic time. And it is a very important moment. And prophecies have been written about it. But it is a moment in the de our destiny for all those who are alive and the destiny of the planet. And it will shape the future, even if the future does not exist. Now, whether this moment happens next year in December or tomorrow or happened yesterday and we just didn't notice it, There are very visible signs. And of course, the most visible sign at the moment is this cataclysm we are creating. They say it is the end of a 65 million era cycle, this depletion of species, this destruction of the ecosystem. 65 million year cycle, that is a big cycle. Never before have species been depleted at such a rate and we have no understanding of it because we have lost the teachings to help us to read it. What does it mean? Our scientists argue about it. People have ecological ideas. What does it mean for our soul? What does it mean for the soul of the world? How should we be present at this moment in time? Now, first of all, it is really important to be aware that you cannot just retreat into spiritual practice. There is an idea that if you just do your spiritual practice, everything will be OK. There is, of course, a spiritual teaching that is completely correct, that everything is always OK. Every moment is perfect. Every moment is true to its own nature. And yes, that is true. And the opposite is also true, because mystical truths are always paradoxical. It is not like that. We have a responsibility at this moment in time. We have a spiritual responsibility at this moment in time. We have a spiritual responsibility to the world of which we are a part. Jung, Carl Jung had a deep understanding. He said, one of the greatest cataclysms of this time 
is that we have lost the understanding that the spark of our soul, our individual light, is a spark in the light of the world's soul. What we think, how we live, how we live our light, that spark within us, directly influences the world's soul, the whole of creation. We are responsible. When there was this oil spill in the Gulf that was so terrible, it was really important to realize that we were each responsible for that. Everybody who ever gets into a motor car, whoever gets onto an airplane, participated in the spill of oil in the Gulf. We are responsible. And here, because of our spiritual awareness, we should realize we are one. We are not individuals, we are one. We are part of this living, organic, dying whole. And just spiritual practice on its own is not the answer. There is a darkness coming. Now, I spoke about this a while ago. I wrote some articles about this. And a lot of spiritual people got very angry. They said, how can you talk about darkness? Everything is light. <laughs> they said, just go into the light of your spiritual awareness, and there is no darkness there. And that is very true, friends. And one can do it. You can sit in meditation. You can close your eyes. You can go to where there is just light and love and you can sit there with a smile on your face. It's a very nice state. One should do it at least once a week. It is, in a way, a bit like spiritual chocolate. It makes you feel good. And it belongs to you. It is real. You go in your heart. There is pure love. But is it the right moment to, to, to remain in that state? Or is there not an awareness we are asked to carry of what is happening in the world? That we are going towards this moment in, in cosmic time at a cataclysmic rate. Each time you read the newspapers, they say the, the ecological destruction is happening faster than anybody predicted. The species are depleting faster than they realize. The fishes are dying. The oceans are becoming acidic. And it is our planet, and we are part of it, and it is part of us. And if there is a need to wake up spiritually, I think there is a real need to wake up to the spiritual implications of what is happening. <clears throat> that there is this darkness that is destroying the world. You can call it corporate greed. That's an easy answer. It is not actually corporate greed. Corporate greed is just a manifestation of it, of this global darkness. Now, what is very interesting about these teachings that the Mayans taught us about time is that they say, next year, our little planet will be, for the first time in many, many thousands of years, aligned to the cosmic center. And when that happens, an enormous amount of energy will come into this plane of existence. Maybe it will happen. Maybe it won't. Maybe nothing will happen. Maybe everything will happen. But as you all know spiritually, what really matters is awareness. You see, when I met my teacher, I had an enormous amount of spiritual energy thrown at me. And many of you have had similar experiences. You meet somebody who is awake, and that awakening hits you. And it can do one of two things. It can hit you so much, you fall back into old patterns and run off to the ice cream bar as fast as you can. Run off into your patterns of codependency because the last thing you want to do is to be awake and take responsibility for being awake. And it can shatter you in a very negative way. Or that energy can go right through you, go right through your spiritual centers, and wake you up. It is the tide. It is that moment in your life for which you have been waiting, maybe even a moment you have been waiting for for lifetimes, and it may never come again, which is why you never know when that will happen. There is actually a Christian teaching that says, the bride never knows the hour when the bridegroom cometh. 
And so the bride always waits, always attentive. So whether anything happens next year or not is not really the point. The point is awareness. The point is to be aware of this moment in time. Now, as I say, you can say, look, this, all moments in time are the same. And yes, there is a very beautiful Zen teaching that says brushing your teeth in the morning is the most important thing you will ever do. And brushing your teeth in the morning is the least important thing you will ever do. And that is true. But there is also another teaching that says we have a certain responsibility. We have a certain responsibility towards the oneness of which we are a part. And there are forces of light, and there are also forces of darkness. And it's time, particularly for those who have a spiritual awareness, to wake up and to be attentive at this moment in time so that if we are needed, we can play our part. We can take the ship that sails. We can be part of the sails that open to the wind. Maybe two years' time, it was like, what was that, 2000 when all the computers were supposed to die? Oh, yeah. Y2K. Y2K, there you go, Y2K. Nothing happened. All the contrary, nothing happened. Maybe we'll still go shopping in Sainsbury's and everything will be fine. The same politicians will be talking the same stuff on the television as they have for years. And maybe not. And maybe something is asked for us because when you meet that energy, it's like when I met that, the light that came through those blue eyes of my teacher. Something was asked of me. It took me 10 years to begin to understand what was asked of me. And many of you have had those moments because it touches the soul. It belongs to the deeper rhythm of our own soul. It belongs to this flow of time that goes through our own soul. So there are these moments in time. There are moments in time in your own life in the life of your own soul. They are very different to our linear concept of time. You can have maybe two or three moments in your whole life. Two or three moments in which a door opens. You don't know where that door is. Suddenly it's open. Suddenly your heart starts to sing. Suddenly you get shivers down your spine. You don't know why. And you can walk through that door and your whole life is changed and it's like a whole completely new life. You go onto a different plane of consciousness. You see things, you meet people you could never have met before, you could never have seen before. Or you can contract. You can stay in your old patterns, even your spiritual patterns. For example, I have a very strong spiritual pattern of being an ascetic, of withdrawing from the world, of just doing my spiritual practice and saying, that's all that matters. And one can sit in meditation for hours. It's beautiful. You leave the world behind. The world ceases to exist. Time has no meaning. But sometimes something calls one to be present. And all I want to say is please, please be attentive. Watch. I'm very intrigued on a much more superficial level, for example, by this Occupy Wall Street movement. Does it have any meaning or not? I, I feel it has a life force. I feel it has a chaotic life force, an organic expression of something. Will it become something else? Will it die? I don't know. I am watching. I am being attentive. It doesn't mean you have to do anything. If you feel called to participate, participate. But be attentive. Real spiritual life requires a quality of attention to the moment that very few people are prepared to really be awake to. And something is going to happen to this planet. You can see it outwardly. Very few people see it inwardly. Very few people see what is happening in the soul of the world and the energies of light that throw through, flow through the world and the currents of darkness that are trying to stop it. For example, I give you just an example. I'm not allowed to say very much. But there is this world is a living spiritual being, and there is a possibility, a possibility that it can make a shift in evolution, just like we can make a shift in evolution on our own. 
It's a possibility that doesn't come very often. The Mayans say once every 26,000 years. It's not very often. In the lifetime of the world, maybe it's not so long. But there is this possibility. There are certain forces and certain people and certain souls and certain energies that is constellating to help the whole world, the whole of which we are. We're not just a part. We are the whole. Remember that. Make a shift in evolution. The heart of the world could start to sing. Things could come alive again in a way we cannot even imagine because we have forgotten we are living in a dying planet. We have forgotten the magic of creation. We no longer know how to hear the voices of the birds or the plants. We have forgotten their language. And there is this light, this energy, this power that is coming together to make this happen. And there are also, because we live in this plane of duality, and although there is the non-dual truth is true, we also live in a plane of duality. There is light and dark. There is morning and night. It is actually one of the first awakenings of human consciousness is to be aware of the duality of light and dark, of night and day. There are also forces of darkness trying to stop it. And the forces of darkness keep everybody asleep because if people are asleep, they can stop anything happening. Just as if you are asleep, you miss the moment in your own life. That is why wake up is a primal spiritual slogan. Wake up and you can catch the moment in your own life. Wake up and you can help the world to awaken. And there is no difference between the world awakening and a human being awakening. And if you, and many people here know, if you know what it's like when you awaken, you know how devastatingly important it is, how it makes you like Hafiz said, just burst out with joy and laughter. The glorious sound of a soul waking up. If you can be there, be present when this energy, if it comes, comes into the world, so you can open to it and not contract, if you can be awake, then I think we have done our duty. And remember, there is no difference. This is an ancient esoteric teaching. It's called macrocosm and microcosm. There is no difference between the individual and the whole. What happens to the individual, how an individual can wake up, is exactly the same as how the world can wake up. You know what happens when your own heart starts to sing. You know what happens when you see the light of your true self. And just imagine for a moment, just like that ray of sunshine coming through at dawn, coming through those ancient stone sentinels and hitting the altar stone. And imagine the change in that moment. Imagine that happening to the whole world that is within your heart of which you are a part. And one last thing, please do not take this too seriously. <laughs> it is always important to remember the laughter at the heart of things, the joke within creation. So on that note, friends, God bless. Thank you so much. <laughs>